are glad you're with us this morning, and I hope you will uh, be blessed by what we're sharing as we look at the life of a, uh, a man who, like us, makes mistakes, and like us, sometimes has to live with those, and yet, like us, a man who finds comfort in God and kind of tends to find the way to get back on course as he looks to the Father for guidance. By the way, isn't the world around us beautiful? Uh, this is one of our little surprises that we have sometimes. It's called a West Virginia white. I know you have it, find it hard to believe why it would be called a West Virginia white. Um, but anyway, that's one of our spring visitors here in White County. Would you join me in our confession together? I am a child of God. I am saved by grace. I live each day by faith. I'm ready to hear God's word. I hope you are. Hey, Isaac. Good to see you, buddy. Love you. Let's stand for the reading of the word of God. I don't have my glasses this morning, so I don't know what you're liable to hear before the day's over, but uh, I'll step aside and look at the big print, and we'll read this interesting story together. Genesis 21, 8 says, When Isaac grew up and was about to be weaned, Abraham prepared a huge feast to celebrate the occasion. But Sarah saw Ishmael, the son of Abraham, and her Egyptian servant, Hagar, making fun of her son Isaac. So she turned to Abraham and demanded, Get rid of that slave woman and her son. He is not going to share the inheritance with my son Isaac. I won't have it. This upset Abraham very much because Ishmael was his son. But God told Abraham, do not be upset over the boy and your servant. Do whatever Sarah tells you, for Isaac is the son through whom your de descendants will be counted. But I will also make a nation of descendants of Hagar's son because he is your son too. So Abraham got up early the next morning, prepared food and a container of water, and strapped them on Hagar's shoulders. And then he sent her away with her son, and she wandered aimlessly in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water was gone, she put the boy in the shade of a bush, and then she went and sat down by herself about 100 yards away. I don't want to watch the boy die, she said as she burst into tears. But God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven, Hagar, what's wrong? Don't be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Go to him and comfort him, for I will make a great nation from his descendants. And then God opened Hagar's eyes, and she saw a well full of water. She quickly filled her water container and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy as he grew up in the wilderness, and he became a skillful archer, and he settled in the wilderness of Paran. And his mother arranged for him to marry a woman from the land of Egypt. May God bless this wonderful story of God's grace and his people said. Amen. Amen. Have a seat. Let's dismiss our kids for their lesson. Keep punching buttons, don't I? The wonders... Of technology. Besides that, if I keep the screen moving around, it keeps everybody awake. So, a lot of stories about this man Abraham, aren't there? And you know, it's interesting to me as you look at Abraham's life; they aren't all they aren't all uh, good stories. Uh, it's interesting to me that when God lets us see the people through whom He works. He lets us see everything about them. We see the uh, we see the good things, but we also see the warts and the blemishes. Uh, God doesn't tend, and I think this is comforting. I hopeful hope to all of us. God doesn't paint halos around His Bible characters. He doesn't put halos on their heads. He lets us see that God works every day through people 
And people are terribly flawed. And people make mistakes. And people have to make mid-course corrections all the time. And that's just, you know, and yet in the course of all of that, is there anything, is there anything more wonderful than God's forgiveness? Is there anything for which we should be more thankful than the forgiveness of God? I mean, every time we read the story of one of these characters, David, whether it's David or, or Samson or Abraham or Simon Peter, we are reminded of their humanity and yet we are reminded of the grace and forgiveness of God in every one of their lives. Somehow amidst the tragedy of their lives, God snatches victory. And I think David catches that sense in, in the very finest way in Psalm 103 when he says this. He looks up in a moment of, of exhilaration and he says, Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. And then this, this incredible statement in verses 11 and 12. For his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. And he has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. Or as casting crowns says, from one hand to the other. What a great blessing it is to have the forgiveness of God. And, and as we track these stories of human failure, of human, uh, uh, of human uh, messes, and as we try to watch God patiently step in from time to time to try to sweep up the mess and clean things up and, and keep the plan on track, and as, as these humans step in again and again and, and one more time stir everything the wrong way and make God come back and fix it, just remind yourself, God does that in our lives every day. He's, he straightens up our messes. He holds us together. He keeps us moving in the right direction. Let me say this about that, about sin, though. And this is another reality we have to deal with. Forgiveness is a wonderful reality that we need to hold on to. But here's the other reality of life. Though every sin is forgivable, the effects of some sins are not erasable. I wish it was. I wish when God fixed my mistakes, he would fix all the collateral damage that they've created. The addict wishes, looking back, that when God forgives the addiction and forgives the, the wreck that they've made of their lives, I know many times they wish that God could bring back the wife they lost and the children they've alienated and the lives they've destroyed and the jobs they've, they've lost because of bad choices. Don't you know that the drunk driver who has taken a life on the highway has wished a thousand times that the God who forgives their drunkenness could restore the life they took. But it doesn't work that way. Because the world in which we live has certain unalterable courses that it follows that were set in, in, in motion by God. And God says that, you know, if I do things that are destructive to my health, I can be forgiven for those things, but my health may not come back. That if I destroy a relationship by introducing sin into it, the sin can be forgiven, and I can go on, and I can go to heaven and be successful. But I may never have that relationship back again because the course of life has moved on. The flow of the river is somewhere else now. And I can't go back and relive that moment. 
That's something that Abraham has had to learn over the course of the years as he walked, even though he walked by faith in God, even though he was a man declared righteous by God, he was also a man who sometimes had to deal with collateral damage. And in that regard, he's not unlike all the rest of us as we walk in our journey through life with God. Let's look at what goes on here as God as God walks us through this, as we see this family in trouble, and boy, are they in trouble. You know, uh, one of the things that I've noticed about reading the stories of Bible characters is that one of the messes they always seem to find themselves in is family relationships. Are anything, is anything more complicated than families? Are any relationships more complex and difficult and cross-connected than family relationships. And they get really, really, really messy sometimes. And uh, Abraham's going to find himself in a mess. You might remember Genesis 16. We looked at several weeks ago. Remember how Abraham and Sarah tried to preempt God in this thing about the promised child? God had told them that that even though they were getting up in years, he would give them a child of promise and that that child would bless all men and would carry on and build a great nation and would number like the stars of the heavens and the sands of the sea and that all nations would be blessed through him. And so began the promise of the one that we would, well, that we learned last week is Isaac. But as the years went by and the time passed, like all human beings, they got impatient. I mean, Lord, I'm not getting any younger, you know? I mean, I, I, I've read the, Lord, I've read the medical journals, and they tell me how much testosterone I lose every year, and I've lost most of what I've got, and I don't have very much left, and time is running out, and we still don't have a child, and besides that, my wife is old, and maybe we need to help you out, Lord, because it's obvious you can't do this and so Sarah comes to Abraham and she says listen my Egyptian handmaiden Hagar she's young she's in the she's in the flower of her womanhood she's perfectly capable of having a child and the custom in our culture today is that a handmaiden of your wife can be taken as a surrogate wife and can bear a child to the family on behalf of the wife, that child is adopted as the heir apparent and will finally have the son that God promised. The only problem is this. God never promised Abraham a child through Hagar. God promised Abraham a son through Sarah. But somehow in the translation, that got missed. So they do the surrogate mama thing. And sure enough, it works. Hagar gets pregnant. She has a baby, a strapping fine young boy. They named him Ishmael. And he has been growing up now. Uh, almost 20 years have passed. 17 years have passed now. How about that? 17 years. And so um, when our story picks up here in verse 8 of chapter 21 in Genesis, Ishmael is 17 years old. He is now a young man. He is old enough by custom of the time to go out from his father's house, find himself a wife, put up his own tent, and start his own family. The Bible says that Isaac was old enough to wean. He's three years old. He's a three-year-old. Tradition back then was that you would, you would nurse a child until they were about three. Some of you ladies are grimacing. But in that day and time, uh, you didn't have formula. And you couldn't go and get Similac, stuff like that at the store. And so, you know, you nursed a child until they were about three was considered the age of weaning. So, what we're told is that Abraham gave a dinner in honor of Isaac, little three-year-old Isaac, little bitty baby, 
just barely walking, little bitty fella. And his big old grown-up 17-year-old brother, strapping young man, muscular young man, Ishmael, is looking at this little twerp. And he's thinking to himself, yeah, the heir apparent. Sure he is. And it's interesting what it says. And I put the word mocking, but I want you to look at the text again. The Bible says when Isaac grew up and was about to be weaned, three years old, Abraham prepared a huge feast to celebrate the occasion. But Sarah saw Ishmael, the son. Notice, it doesn't say her son. It says the son of Abraham and her Egyptian servant Hagar. Do you catch that? Do you catch that sense of resentment? Do you catch the distance there? This has been a bad blood relationship since the day that baby was born. You remember we went back and it talked about the fact that Abraham and, and Hagar had the child and that Hagar then mocked Sarah because Sarah was not with child and she had born a child. You've always had this rivalry, this, this ugliness between the two women where there's a sense in which the, the servant girl has risen to a position above the, the mistress because she has the child and Sarah does not. Well, now it comes to a head, and guess what? Ishmael has picked up his mama's smart aleck attitude. He's right on top of it. And what it says is what? She sees him making fun of her son Isaac. Anybody remember what the name Isaac means? It means to laugh. The word that's used here for making fun is the exact same root word in Hebrew, but a much more intense form. Which means that he was looking at little brother laugh and making a laughing stock out of him at the dinner needless to say mama bear doesn't like it mama bear bristles when she sees young mr. smart mouth making fun of her son of laughter by laughing at him this is ugly stuff you begin to see a family dynamic that's unraveling here and it's gonna blow up in Abraham's face because what happens is this, Sarah looks up immediately, and I like, I like this, this quote from her. It's a, it's a really what I call a snarky comment. You know what a snarky comment is? It's, it's, just, it's just ugly. It's as mean going the other way as it was coming toward her. She demands that he get Hagar and Ishmael. Not only that she doesn't say, tell that boy to shut up and stop that. That's not right. She says, I want them out of the house. I want them out of the tent. I don't want them in the camp. I don't want them in the neighborhood. I want them gone. I want you to take that woman and that child, and I want you to exile them from our clan. This is the way she puts it. Get rid of that slave woman and her son. Now, a while back, she was the promised redeemer of the whole family heritage. She was the solution to the problem. Now she's that slave woman and her son. By the way, he's Abraham's son too. Fully legitimate son of Abraham. He's not going to share in my son's inheritance. See what she's thinking? And then look, she, look what she says. Now when a woman says that, you better pay attention. I won't have it when she says that the two magic words are yes ma'am and Abraham's no fool I want you to think about now we laugh at that but I want you to think about the dilemma this puts Abraham in in fact that's our next point is Abraham is now caught in a trap Abraham's better nature on one side is in conflict with his better nature on the other side. Isaac is the son of promise, but Ishmael is a son for whom he has responsibility as well. Here's the dilemma he faces. 
We know a great deal about the laws of the ancient Near East. We know how they handled these situations. Having surrogate children within a family was a very common practice back then, and there were laws that were passed in various civilizations, including those from which Abraham came, that govern how you handle those situations because obviously they are complicated family situations. You've got inheritance issues. You've got influence issues. You've got, you know, compatibility issues. How do you settle them? Now, here's the problem. You have two laws that come into play here. One law says that if you bear a child through a surrogate mother, you are bound by law to take care of her and that child for the rest of their lives. You cannot just throw them out. No matter what happens, you are morally obligated to care. It's your child. And by having her bear your child, you have now tied her to you and obligated her to you. You have to take care of her. Now that makes sense, doesn't it? That is immensely fair. She, as a handmaiden, had very little control over the situation, but by getting her pregnant and having a child through her, you have, you have obligated yourself now to take care of her. Do the right thing. You can't just cast her out because your wife doesn't like her. On the other side, you can have her removed if she and the child are willing to waive the right of inheritance. In other words, if you can reach an accommodation and yet at the same time you still have to care for her. In other words, they can give up inheritance rights and they can move away. You still have the obligation to see that they're provided for, but they're no longer in the house, and you no longer have to deal with them. Now, Abraham is stuck on the horns of this dilemma. What do you do? Because. Now, somebody says, okay, so buy them off and send them away. Every penny you spend buying them off is money out of Isaac's inheritance. What has his mother just said? I don't want that punk kid to get one penny of my son's inheritance. So what do you do? And I want you to see how it affects Abraham. He doesn't take this lightly. It says it upset Abraham very much because, fact of life, Ishmael was his son. And by the way, I don't hesitate for a minute to suggest Abraham loved him. I mean, think about it. Abraham has spent 17 years raising this young man to manhood. He sees this young man now becoming a, a handsome, strong young man. He has survived through everything. He's ready to get out on his own and carry on the family name. What daddy wouldn't be proud of that? I, I know all the complexities and all, but what daddy wouldn't be proud of that? He loves this boy. You know, and it is his son. That's not Sarah's son, but it's Abraham's son, and he loves him. So he's really stuck in a tough situation. Had it not been for the grace of God, I don't know how Abraham would have handled this, but I want you to notice that God intervenes. And God doesn't wait for Abraham to cry out and say, what am I going to do? God takes the initiative, as he has so many times in Abraham's life and in Lot's life, you remember when Lot was on the fence about leaving Sodom and Gomorrah, the angel of God finally grabbed him by the arm and just said, come on, nutcase, you better get out of here. And he drags him out the door and just virtually hauls him up the street to get him out of danger. Sometimes God will get pretty dramatic to get you out of a mess. And God intervenes here and tries to help Abraham. And I want you to notice what it says. God says, don't be upset over the boy and your servant. Notice God personalizes it the boy and your servant. Do whatever Sarah tells you, for Isaac is the son. Now, God does reaffirm. He says, hey, I told you that to start with, didn't I? If you had li it's, it's a subtle way of saying, if you had listened to me to start with, we wouldn't have this problem. You catch that? He says, don't let it upset you about the boy and his servant. Do what your wife says. After all, Isaac's the one I told you I was sending. But I'll also make a nation of, the boy, of, the, of Hagar's son because he's your son too. So, 
And I want you to notice how quickly Abraham worked. Evidently, this situation was absolutely toxic. I don't think you have an incident here. I think you have the end of a long, boiling eruption that's about to take place. So the next morning, he gets up, prepares food and water, puts them on Hagar's shoulders, shows her the door, and says, God bless you, good luck. And out she goes. Now I want you to think about that. Hagar is now a single parent. You know, we don't talk much in the church about single parents. There's millions of them in our society. She's a single mom. She's a single mom on her own, no resources, no support, nowhere to go, 17-year-old kid. Good luck. It's a tough situation. And the Bible paints the picture of how tough that situation is because what we see in the next two and a half or a verse and a half, two and a half verses is a woman in the throes of absolute desperation. She heads south from Hebron, which is where Abraham is located. She heads into what is called the wilderness of Beersheba. Now, I've been to that area, and it is, it is desolate. It is empty. It is, is vast. It is largely uninhabited. There are a few dirt roads that go through that area even today. It is a very desolate, very harsh, very unforgiving area. It would be tough for somebody with trained survival skills to live very long in that area on their own, much less a single woman with a 17-year-old kid, a small pouch of water, and a bag of food. She's traveling south because her home was in Egypt, and that's the shortest route to get there. I think she's got to be thinking in the back of her mind, if I can just get home, maybe after all these years, somebody in my family will remember me. Somebody can take me in. Somebody can give me some help. She has no prospect. She can't go out and start a boutique somewhere. And open up a little business. That's not the way society worked back then. She was looking for some place to settle where somebody will recognize her and give her some support. And so she heads to what, what little home she has left. The problem is she's looking at 40 miles of deserted wilderness to the border of Egypt. And then 300 miles of Sahara Desert, Sinai Desert to get to Egypt. She has no chance. How long do you think that bag of food and that flask of water is going to last with a grown woman and a 17-year-old boy? And I got an idea that that 17-year-old boy got most of the food and water, don't you? Yeah, because that's what you do when you're a parent. If it's me or the kid, the kid will make it, and I won't. That's fine. And so she's doing what any good mama has to do. She's trying to take care of her child. The Bible says he sent her away with her son, and she wandered. Look at the word. She wandered aimlessly. She has no sense of direction. She doesn't have a GPS locator. She doesn't have a road map of southern Palestine. There weren't any roads to map anyway. She's just wandering. Maybe even going back over the same track she went over yesterday. She doesn't know where she is. She's disoriented. The water was gone. She put her boy under the shade tree. There, he's failing. She realizes they're neither one going to last much longer, and she just can't bear the thought of watching her son die. And so she puts him the only place she can to give him what little relief she can give him, which is under a, the shade of a bush. And then she wanders 100 yards away, and puts her hands, puts her face in her hands and just waits. And evidently in his suffering, Ishmael is moaning. He's groaning. 
And she's having to listen to that, the death throes of your own child that you've invested your life in. You know, sometimes we don't appreciate the the challenges that our single parents face. We don't understand that loneliness and that, ooh, that was cute. Sometimes we don't appreciate the loneliness, the emptiness of trying to figure out what do we do next? Where do we go next? Who do we turn to now? I think as a church, we need to be much more aware of single parents and what they go through. And we need to reach out and become family to them and become the clan of Abraham to support and encourage them. No single parent has an easy life. And look what it says. The last phrase tells you the story, doesn't it? She burst into tears. I'm going to tell you something. When you cry, God hears you. There are few sounds that God hears more sharply than the cries of pain, the suffering of those whom he cares about. God cares enough that he comes to her aid. I want you to notice what this text says. God heard the boy crying, and an angel of God called to Hagar and said, What's wrong? Don't be afraid. God's heard the boy. Go to your child and comfort him. God's going to take care of you. He finally tells her what he'd already told. He told Abraham he was going to take care of him. He forgot to tell her. Now he tells her personally through an angel. He says, God's going to take care of you and your son's going to be blessed. And it says, God opened her eyes. Isn't that an interesting statement? God opened her eyes. And she saw a well full of water. What luck! What a lucky girl! She happened to find water in the wilderness. Or was she lucky or was she blessed? God opened up a well. And she filled her container and gave the boy a drink. And from there he sustained them until they were able to get out of that wilderness and maybe find a caravan or maybe find a village or somewhere or somehow they were able to find a direction in their lives and were able to get on their feet and move on with their lives. In fact, the last thing we're told. Well, before we do that, let me share with you this passage from Isaiah. And if you're a single parent, just kind of write this one on a card and put it in your pocket. Fear not, you will no longer live in shame. Don't be afraid, there's no more disgrace for you. You will no longer remember the shame of your youth and the sorrows of widowhood. For your creator, God, will be your husband. The Lord of heaven's armies in his, is his name. He's your redeemer, the holy one of Israel, the God of all the earth. For the Lord has called you back from your grief. As though you were a young wife abandoned by her husband, says your God. God says, I will be your husband. I will stand with you. I will be beside you, and I will take care of you. Don't ever think that God, that God neglects certain classes of people. God doesn't see classes of people. God just sees people. He doesn't look at you and say, well, look at you. Your marriage failed. You've got all these kids. You have trouble finding work. You can't pay the bills. <laughs> look at the mess you got yourself into. God hears your cries. God wants to be And by the way, when I say God hears your cries and God wants to be there and God wants to help, I'm talking to the church. We are God in this world. We are the eyes and the hands and the feet and the heart and the mind and the voice of God. And when God says, I love you, we're supposed to be saying, I love you. And when God says, I will give you water, we need to be reminded that Jesus said, I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. 
through the church, God is not just some external force out there. God is a living, breathing presence with arms and feet and hands and hearts in this world. If the book of Acts teaches us anything, it is that the church simply carried on the ministry of Jesus when Jesus left the earth. He left the earth, but he kind of sort of really didn't. He just continued to live here through his people. There's a very powerful message here for us. <clears throat> With God's help, this situation turned around. I need my water. Sorry. Been fighting this all week. I'm not all broken up. I probably am, but for different reasons. Look what it says at the end. <coughs> God was with the boy. How many times do we hear that? Moses, Samuel, David, Jesus, John the Baptist, <coughs> Ishmael. He became a skillful, skillful archer. And guess where his mom got him a wife? She made it back home, didn't she? She found him a wife appropriate to his upbringing, and he became a great nation. Now, let me give you three quick lessons, and I'm going to address one to each of the characters in our story, okay? <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. First of all, let's talk to Sarah. What do we need to say to Sarah? How about beware of the cancerous influence of resentment? Who does resentment affect more than anybody else? The person that holds it. It eats you up. It changes who you are. It turns you into a gnarled, ugly, negative, mean-spirited person, which is everything God doesn't want you to be. you got to let go of your rights and let go of your... You're, you know, me, 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 and just say, hey, listen, things haven't worked out. I haven't been treated right. I've been wronged by others, but I've never been whipped to the point of bleeding. I've never had a crown of thorns on my head or a spear thrust in my side, and I've never been hung on a cross for people that spit in my face. I've had some knocks in life, but nothing like that. And if he can do that for me, can he not sweeten my spirit and help me to see a better way of life than to just be filled with hate and anger and resentment? Abraham's home could have been a very different place if Sarah had taken a very different attitude. Let's talk to Abraham a minute. What would we say to Abraham? How about beware of the consequences of compromise? You go messing with God's way of doing it. You change the plan. You try to fix it. You try to outthink God. And what do you end up doing? You end up digging yourself into a hole that gets deeper and deeper. And the more you try to dig out, the deeper the hole gets. And the longer life goes on, the more complex and complicated it gets. Make no mistake, part of the resentment that Sarah, that Sarah fed in her life was contributed to by Abraham. You know? Every time she'd reach, he'd reach over and stroke Ishmael's hair. Every time he'd take him hunting. Every time he'd pass him a little extra meat off the plate. What do you think that did to her? How do you think that made her feel? Or those times when, you know, Ishmael would do something that made him proud and he would look over at Hagar and he'd wink at her. Not because he was trying to insult Sarah, but because, hey, he loved Hagar too. She bore him Ishmael. Beware the influence of compromise. Once you start down that road, it's a hard trip back. 
and there's a lot of rough spots along the way. And what do we say to Hagar? You know, she's not, she doesn't come out of this lily white. She doesn't come out as virtuous and wonderful. But, you know, she's more victim than anything else. She really is. She's just kind of along for the ride. And she got sucked into some stuff here she hadn't planned on. She came out of Egypt as a, as a servant girl. Her job was to iron the clothes and lay out the shoes and, you know, help with the bath and stuff like that. It wasn't her job to have babies and negotiate family complications and get along with the mistress and all that stuff. And yet, sometimes life deals you cards you never thought you'd get, doesn't it? And yet, to her, the message is clear. Keep your eyes on God, and he'll bless you. You just keep your head in the game. Keep your eyes on the ball. Keep the target in mind. And God will, God will take care of you. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What does the Bible say? And all these things will be taken care of as well. You've got to put God first. And it wasn't until she turned to God that she turned it around. And that's a powerful message in this story. There's a lot we can learn from this old man and his family. He's still on the journey. He's still walking the wilderness. He's still tripping his way along. But he's getting there. Oh, but let me tell you something. The biggest test is yet to come. Just a question as we think about our next lesson. What's the most precious thing you possess? And how tightly do you hold it? Interesting question, isn't it? Coming attractions. There's a lot to learn from this story, though, about dealing with God and, and trusting God and following his plan and about learning how to get along with each other in, in a godly way. If you're not a Christian, I'd like to encourage you to come to Christ this morning. It's just that simple. Just come to Jesus, give him your sins, get rid of them, let him lift the burden. Just like, just like God reviving Hagar and Ishmael in the wilderness, God will revive you and give you new life in Christ. If you're a Christian, you're not where you should be. We can pray about that. You can pray about that. Just repair that relationship and get it to where it should be. The key in life is you've got to keep your eye on the prize and continue walking toward God. Whatever your need is, we love you enough. We want to encourage you as we stand and sing.